Please welcome Brandon Martin Anderson. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brandon Martin Anderson, and um, uh, this, today we focused on ways that we can relate information to position. Um, so far, we've mostly focused on uh, the first two dimensions of position, latitude and longitude, x and y. And I'm here to talk about um, uh, the other positions of uh, the other dimensions of position. For example, elevation and um, and time. And so I'm here to talk specifically about how to show uh, maps in four dimensions. So let's start. In October of 1812, as it was getting cold in Moscow, <clears throat> Napoleon Bonaparte had recently marched uh, 100,000 men into Moscow and, fi and found the city gutted. Um, and faced with enduring a Russian winter with no provisions, decided he'd be better off in, Mos in uh, Paris. Um, in the ensuing two-month march, uh, 95,000 men, or about 95% of his army, died of cold and starvation far from their homes. Now, it is difficult to convey with enough emphasis how much of a jerk Napoleon was for doing this. Um, here's my own best attempt. Uh, it's made using Google Maps, and uh, because I don't actually own Excel. Um, uh, day since the retreat is plotted horizontally, and the size of the Russian army is plotted vertically. Now, this is a weak sauce evidence, of course. I mentioned the topic specifically because one of the best prosecutions of Napoleon is um, Charles Minard's 1969 map made, made uh, popularized by Tufte in the visual display of quantitative information. Um, and here is Minard's map. The interesting thing about this map is that it shows time. And most maps are like photographs. They show the world frozen at a moment, but Minard's map shows something as it changes over time. And by showing quantities and the time that separates them gives us a picture of rate. My chart does the same thing, but Minard's also shows location, allowing us to see that Napoleon's men not only died at great rate, but far from their homes. In the past, mapping an object's location in time and space uh, was frequently used in planning for and memor memorializing military action. This is difficult because in battles, things can be in front of, behind, beside, above, below, uh, in the future, or in the past. And maps only give us two dimensions with which to express all of this data. Uh, here's a map of the Battle of Gettysburg, an event, an event involving 150,000 men fighting over the course of three days. And in this map, all of that is shown in a single image. Um, up is north and right is, uh, right is to the east, like normal. The third dimension is shown schematically by illustrations of hills. You can see little cross-hatched hills. On the bottom of the map, there's a ridge running over to the left um, where a lot of the action took place. The position in time is denoted by labels. There's a, there's a label July 1st for one charge, July 2nd, and July 3rd for different charges. Um, this map squishes a lot of data into a single image where it's difficult, difficult to get a picture of what was actually happening at the time. Um, alternatively, one could express uh, each day on its own map. Um, along those lines, here's a sequence of maps that I actually got from Wikipedia um, showing each of the three days of battle as its own map. And this gives you a clearer picture of what's going on. Now, we have three maps in this case, but it wouldn't hurt to have six. Um, if we had 50 or 120, we could string them all together into an animation. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an animation of the Battle of Gettysburg, but I do have this. Um, here's a map recently produced by Slate showing job creation and job loss over the course of two and a half years. Dots represented where jobs are being lost or gained, and the size of the dots corresponds to the amount of jobs lost or gained. If the dot is blue, jobs are being gained. If the dot is red, jobs are being lost. Um, it was fine for a little while, and uh, it was only really bad in the Midwest, and fine on the West Coast, but in the last couple of months, um, we've seen tremendous job loss over the entire country, including the West Coast. Um, again, this gives, again, this gives us a picture of location, magnitude, and also rate presented in massive quantity 
all at the same time. But far from being a bewildering attack on our senses, it gives us uh, some insight into what's happening at a like, four-dimensional shape. Now, if that hit too close to home, here's an illustration I put together of every bus arrival and departure in Portland, Oregon over the course of one day. Um, it gives an instant and overall perspective on what's happening um, around Portland. And uh, it, it looks biological, it looks like ants. A friend of mine um, hates rats and also hates this illustration. <laughs> um, you can see a lot of things in this you can't see by looking at schedules. Uh, you, can't, you can see, for example, um, early on in the animation, all of the buses converged on one place at about 5 in the morning before uh, general service started, and I guess those are all commuters converging on downtown. Um, in this image, you can see not only where the buses go, but how frequently and how fast. There's a schedule off to the lower right-hand side that's um, moving much more quickly than the rest of the buses, and I assume it's some sort of freeway. Um, now, I think... Public transit is fascinating. A, a, a bus is a little piece of warped space. It's like a moving sidewalk that sort of disappears and, and appears. Um, but the fact that you can only jump into this hyperspace at particular locations and at particular times makes the world a sort of rich and shifting place for a transit rider. Um, a map of transit must correspondingly warp and bend according to position and time. Uh, here's a map made by Tom Carden, um, uh, Stamen, he's actually present, and it warps the map of the London Tube according to um, uh, how distant two stops are from each other in time. Along similar lines, um, here is something that I made recently with Front Seat Software. Uh, we teamed up to uh, create walk score transit time maps. Now, Front Seat makes a thing called walk score, which tells you based on the proximity uh, of uh, proximity of amenities to a location, how easy it would be to live there car-free. Um, and it doesn't include transit, so we set about to fix that. But it turns out that the things that you can reach from a location using transit vary depending on the time of day, which makes it difficult to uh, make an impartial walk score. But um, it does make for some interesting maps. So we made these maps, and this is a website that you can, you can visit. Um, this is an image of all the places that you can reach um, within 45 minutes from Powell Station and downtown San Francisco at 6 a.m. And here is a place that you can reach, um, everywhere you can reach from 1 p.m. Uh, a little bit later in the day, the coverage is somewhat greater. And if you went out club hopping and tried to take the bus after last call, here's everywhere you could reach at um, 3 a.m. You're pretty much out of luck. <laughs> um, now what we're showing here, much like Napoleon's uh, March is two events separated by visual, rep rep visual representation of a span of time, allowing us to see rate. If two lines are very close together, we can only move very slowly, such as at 3 a.m. or around Twin Peaks. If two events are very far apart, um, then we know that we can move quickly, such as along the BART line. Um, Walk score transit time maps are constant time contours in a time surface that looks, in the case of Seattle, somewhat like this. On the left is what you'd see on the website. On the right is kind of what's going on inside the machine's brain. It has this, um, this is three-dimensional, or I guess four-dimensional time surface. Um, that time surface is composed of uh, every vertex in a shortest path tree. Um, to switch back to San Francisco, a shortest path tree, in the case of San Francisco, rooted downtown, would look something like this. Um, the red lines are the BART and the Caltrain. Uh, the black lines are walking. I don't have any San Francisco Muni or any other transit agency in there, but it shows you the shortest path to every point from one particular point. Um, it is difficult to see at this image. So this image is actually a four-dimensional tree, and each vertex in the tree has both position and time, and time has both position and time. But it's difficult uh, to tell that just from looking in, in this two-dimensional image. Um, so we have four dimensions, but only two dimensions with which to show them. So here's my best attempt to span the gap between um, the contour maps that I showed you and the, uh, the tree map that I showed you. So here's the shortest path tree. You can grow it outward, and you can select points on the shortest path tree to show the path from the origin of the tree to all other points. And um, what's interesting about this image is that you can display the time aspect by flipping it on its side. Um, and by seeing the time aspect, once the, once the tree is on its side, you can uh, see that the um, contour is actually a horizontal plane cutting the shortest path tree. 
Um, now, looking at this tree in this way, looking at the tree in this way gives us another way to look at um, uh, at this this image. You can see the rate. You can see um, that black lines move more quickly. You can see that yellow lines move more slowly. And um, and, uh, and it's really just a really great way for me to kind of get an image of what's going on here. So I'd love to uh, ramble on more, um, but uh, I'm out of time. So thank you very much. Uh, here are some, some things and people that I've talked about over the course of this talk, and uh, thank you.